Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, we're talking about marketing and esports. With me is ex marketing expert, Alex Hutchie. Welcome, Alex. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, well, great to have you. And what made you interested in esports? Um, so I got started with esports actually just by watching Twitch. Um, I thought the network was great when I first got started and watched a lot of my favorite games before I started to play. Okay, so you're actually a big fan. Yes. <laughs> what are your favorite games? Um, so I'm a huge PC gamer. Um, I started off by playing like Unreal Tournament, Total Annihilation. And now I love playing a lot of uh, Rocket League is probably one of my favorite games. And then I also love uh, mobile games uh, such as Clash Royale made by Supercell in a game okay. studio. Okay, so, um, and so what made you get interested in marketing? Um, so my marketing background spans from fashion uh, when I was attending college. And then also when I finished college, I had an internship as a trend, uh, at a trend predicting agency. Um, so that really got me started with uh, learning how to research, uh, looking further into like subcultures and youth culture. And uh, when gaming finally started to form a career path of its own, um, I quickly saw that as an option to take a lot of my fashion and direct to consumer marketing onto esports, which is a very similar as far as like working with young people, um, getting products into influencers' hands, and also um, just finding the latest trends in, in esports. Okay. Uh, why should a company consider entering into this space? Um, so I think with esports, you have a lot more genuine influencer marketing with products. Um, so one thing that I see is very successful happening on TikTok is that you have these very organic reviews on products, experiences. And I think that's something that um, brands couldn't even imitate from doing a paid commercial or creating something that is a bit more high production. I think now really the future of creating content is definitely just being made right on your phone. Okay. so. That brings me brings us to the issue of authenticity. Is authenticity important when you're looking at branding in esports? I think so. I think that gamers are very particular as far as how they see product being presented to them. Um, there's a lot of product that is sold at a very high price point, um, but then there's also a lot of great product that's available for gamers when they're just getting started, or even if they have an interest in the technology side, which is building PCs, uh, putting together their streaming setup. I think that having a very authentic way of presenting your product to people is important because you really want to build communities and fans that are going to stick with you as your product grows and really give you the honest feedback that's going to help you stay in the industry. Okay. And so what is the target market um, in esports? So e the target market for esports can actually start as young as middle school because that's actually when a lot of gamers may start to watch and stream a lot of games. Um, for when you get into high school, you have a bit more spending power because of course a high schooler can get a job, buy any of the things that they want. And they're also competing for, if they're into sports, sports scholarships and sports, um, sports branding and wanting to get more into buying things. So the thing with uh, sports, pardon me, the thing with esports and the thing with sports is that you still have players that are being introduced to brands very young so that it gets instilled in them that they want to participate in these brands and buy them as soon as they can. I mean, I can remember my first experience playing a racing game. And I mean, to this day, like BMW was my first car because of that experience. And it's like you start those brands, that brand exposure young so that when you can become of age, you, you those are the brands that you want to like grow up and drive and like, you know, customize and have that be a part of like, how you identify and join a community. Sure. And so how, you know, what is the range of age for um, uh, esports in terms of like how high would it go up and what would be the gender um, allocation? Great question. So I think that when it comes to the age, you have your middle schoolers that are looking to start gaming or they're looking for more of like a community and building um, just working with other kids I think is really important so if some kids gravitate more to field sports um, that's a good way for them to socialize but 
but then you also have a group of kids that really enjoy just being on the computer. Um, and I think still having that community aspect is very important, even if you know, you're playing a solo game. Um, and then you move into high school to college and the college level is something that I think you see a lot more competition, you see a lot more um, earnings that can be made. And then I think also to another um, age group to think about is just the casual gamers. A lot of uh, Twitch streamers are also just people that have nine to fives and also stream as well. But really a lot of people show up for like the personality, they show up for their level of production. And I think that's also a market that can be tapped in as far as sponsorships or just seeing a community grow of gamers that I guess are a bit more career or a bit more experienced as far as like they come from other industries and that they happen to have a very like very well-known presence online. So those are kind of the ranges that I see as far as like gamers and casual gamers versus competitive gaming. So I think that there's a lot of brands that can really start reaching out um, and just experiment with the different audiences that a lot of streamers have put in a lot of hard work to grow. And so how does it divide between male and female? Um, you know, I think we traditionally think of the market being young men. And, but do you think that there's an audience, is there a female market? Yeah, I think the female market or girl, girl gamer is becoming more of a thing that is existing. And the representation is very important, but also to like, to know that there's a safe place for young girls to game and get that experience in that community. I think that as we get started right now, seeing a lot of like um, women only led or women only tournaments, um, I think those are good right now for representation and also keeping a nice friendly environment. And as we start to just have more serious conversations about just online and toxicity online and just some things that just aren't really appropriate for you know being online and gaming and just focusing on the game. I think that as we kind of mature with this industry and also just from being online um, that you know there wouldn't have to be this sort of separation of gamers from you know male and female is that we can really focus on the game. Um, but I think getting started, it's just really important to show that representation and women leading in gaming, whether they are on the organization side or the operations or gamers themselves. I think that's really inspiring for a lot of young people that are going to get into gaming and make a great gaming gaming culture because they realize how it can affect them, you know, not just on the game, but also like just the mental health of just being online all the time and being exposed to sort of the comments that are just online that just come with the territory of being online. So you mentioned BMW, um, and that's, um, you would call that a non-endemic brand, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, like what is the difference between a non-endemic versus an endemic brand? We hear that a lot with eSports. Um, so to define that, I would look at um, when you're gaming, you have your actual like game console versus you have the accessories that go with it. So headphones to mechanical keyboard, and then you also have the brands that are visibly in the game. So in most recently, um, Cyber 2077 had Porsche um, endorse them as like the official car in the game. That would be a good example of a non-endemic brand where it's not so much like a part of the gamer and their experience. It's more of what the gamers are experiencing and visualizing from the game producers that um, are using brands or mimicking sort of like the culture in which the characters are in that's very similar to um, real life experiences. So what non-endemic brands other than Porsche and uh, BMW have entered the space? Um, I think also clothing plays a big part. Um, so the way that a character styles, um, looking at things that are similar to like what cities they're in, um, just anything that could be similar to like either something a pop culture reference. I think all of those are considered a type of branding in a sense that um, still leave an impression on the player and also the cosplay being something that also is like very big into gaming, anime, manga. You know, I think all those references play into the culture of, you know, gamers are not just solo game, solely focused on gaming. They also have like a culture that is just very imaginative. And I think that 
games really are a way to express themselves and also a community that they can have fun in as well. So that's, uh, I think games are very interesting in how they incorporate other aspects of life into them. So, so as a consumer um, of games and, and uh, being someone who is a gamer, um, have you noticed um, the marketing directed towards you? Um, I think at times there are some characters that emerge, like for me personally, like my narrative in gaming. Um, I think that, you know, definitely is more like representation becomes like more of a thing. I think that there will be more characters and just more gamers that, that are just relatable to people that are new to gaming or have been thought about it. Um, I think that you also have like the casual gaming, like um, such as like politicians being on gaming and live streaming and just being a part of pop culture. I think all of that is a great way to show that gaming is this community that is very, that can be very inclusive and that it's also, you know, you have the competitive side, which is the esports, and then you also have casual gaming. So I think that, you know, just as more people kind of see it as a career path, that it will start to have more representation that I think games not only will start with the creativity side, but also to in the industry, you'll see more organizations that have that diversity and inclusion that are really represent that really are representing the culture that's emerging right now. So how does esports compare with traditional sports as a branding medium? Um, so I think that the players still have the same likeliness that they can monetize, um, just as similar to a sports team having jerseys, branding, um, the television series that, um, sorry, everything being televised. I think that esports has a very similar thing that they're experiencing. Um, one production that I really love um, a lot is um, I really like how Rocket League conducts their um, their tournaments. And then I also love how Supercell does a lot of their filming of their productions for their tournaments as well. And then you also have ESPN Esports as well, which is an emerging platform and Venn Media. Um, I think that those are places that are raising funds, um, realizing that how you can broadcast esports is just as exciting and just as a spectator sport as traditional field sports as well. Now, if a company wants to market or advertise their product, uh, or a service in esports, what should they do? Uh, I think that getting familiar with the culture of the game in which you are wanting to advertise in. So either it be figuring out what sort of influencers, what games they like to play, or just looking at what types of the type of game genre that you would want to be interested into. I think a great way for, re for representing your brand is for media placement. So either being the studio in which they are live streaming out of or the gear in which they're wearing something that doesn't make it too forced as far as like you know this is an obvious sponsorship i think that's something that um still keeps the the character well still keeps the the live streamer uh you know just honest to their brand and it's not so much like you know a paid like of course it's a paid sponsorship but it's something that if you really get to know the player and understand like the culture that they're building and really see um, multiple influencers as a way to really bring your brand to that space. I think that there's a lot of data that shows um, how the ads are being placed. In addition to, I think that there's a lot of resources that the gaming community could use as far as like production value to really bring that up as far as showing it as, you know, something that's not like a lot of the production is just shot like in a spare bedroom or at home. Um, but also too, it's really exciting to see like live studios emerge and eventually when the world opens back up to seeing like audiences and having it really be that spectatorship. I think that's something that brands can look at on how can they position themselves in either the viewing. So like when people are watching other people play or even just brands that work with the lifestyle of the live streamer. I think that's a great way for brands to start getting involved in the space if they they want to have brand exposure to a younger audience and also to people that are watching and actively buying. Yeah, because, uh, you know, that kind of goes to authenticity because, you know, I, I think um, that you're, you're kind of explaining a way that a brand can become more authentic by familiarizing uh, themselves with the space. 
So um, now let's look at um, should should a brand uh, basically go after a like someone like Ninja or Shroud, you know, an independent streamer, um, or would it be better to um, advertise on platforms such as Twitch or YouTube? And um, I think that it would be interesting to possibly look at a particular city and look at what gaming culture is there, um, because that's a way for you to really tap into the actual player and the life that they're living. And I think that, you know, besides it being the games that, that a lot of players are playing, it's still about the people and it's about uh, gamers as a community coming together and having a game that brings us all together. But I think that to really show something more interesting or to even see how micro influencers and even the more um, larger influencers with bigger followings, I think that it would be very interesting to see how one influencer might engage with the product or service that you're offering to the gaming community versus, you know, working with the already well-established live streamers that are there. I think that it opens up that opportunity once again for representation of that, you know, you don't need to have a huge following to potentially work with a brand, but it's more about engagement, which I think is to really step up and not just go off the vanity metrics that are there. And I think that that type of research from a brand takes some time, but I think that you'll have a long lasting relationship with an influencer rather than just, you know, blitzing your product out there just to make an impression on the gaming community, but really to stick with a set of influencers or a game style that people will grow with you as your company grows. And you mentioned metrics. Um, so what metrics are there available to determine what a brand's reach is in the space? Yeah, so there are some emerging um, startups that are making metrics that take all of the data from viewership on Twitch, um, maybe followers on your actual Instagram, or well, yeah, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, you know, all the all the major big five platforms that are out there. I think that what still is being discovered is how exactly do you measure the viewership? Like when do when is the peak view? Of course, when people get on, and then also like when do when do people drop off? And then also too within the stream, um, there's so much um, because uh, a stream could be close to anywhere from like an hour to four hours in a, in a gaming session, it's very interesting to see what sort of tools will be made to track that sort of brand engagement that's, that's happening over time and to really give those solid facts to um, partnerships and to sponsorships to really show the actual data. But I think for now, I think that it's, when you're working with an influencer and they have an engaging audience, you can kind of go off either, I mean, still affiliate, affiliate programs are great because they give content creators a great way to talk about product and to showcase their stream and their setup. And I think that does have a big metric that is transferred from the code that players are being able to enter um, for their community in order to see their sales. Um, but I think that, you know, as we kind of go along, more metrics will emerge from the actual viewing of, um, like the viewing of the actual foot but it, how to explain that it's it'd be similar to like if you're watching YouTube um, for hours like when exactly do you feel inclined to buy something from being on YouTube for hours in the evening there's still I mean it's it's still kind of like a loose uh, type of survey or really there's no data to back that up quite yet but I know that that's something that from a marketing background like you definitely want to figure out like, you know, at what point should I interject the brand in order to get them the highest return from this investment of working with this influencer. But I think more importantly, if you focus on the community and building up your brand around it, I think that that has a longer impact than just trying to place the product. Like one of my favorite uh, headphones is uh, Turtle Beach and Steel Series. I think they're doing really well right now with a lot of the content that they're creating especially seeing like a lot of people like from their company on the TikTok. Um, I think that's like pretty cool to see like how they're creating more community and they just so happen to sell really cool headphones. It leads to this idea of fragmentation and marketing fragmentation in terms of 
like you're at your you might be targeting um, a US audience because your brand is or service is located in the United States yet it just so happens that a certain percentage of those viewing that particular influencer or that particular platform would be in China or would be in South Korea um, how um, you know how do you deal with that so you don't waste impressions that's that is a very interesting question um i'm not as well versed in sort of an international viewership of a product being made but i still think that it's something that maybe from a local standpoint it would be interesting to see potentially local brands networking with influencers that are doing these longer live streams and potentially sponsoring them with some sort of in-kind sponsorship or even access so, so I think that's um, I think that's an interesting, an interesting fact to further like do research and really track to see who's really figuring out like what viewership is from more of an international market versus what's domestic as far as like American culture and the different products that they place. Um, but I, I love that gaming organizations are worldwide, and I think that's something to as, yeah, just as it goes further, like you know that would be something I could, I could definitely speak further on as far as like international international viewership and products being being placed how do you think the pandemic has influenced um uh marketing in these sports do you think that that's caused um there to be more interest in marketing in this space i think so i think that because a lot of people are, are at home and wanting more at home entertainment that you have seen an increase in game consoles, especially uh, the PS5 that's coming out, the predicted sales are, you know, double or triple than what they are usually expecting the same quarter. Um, I think that a lot of people too are seeing that, you know, the stay at home culture may be something that it can be enhanced either with like VR technology, which is uh, has its season, especially with like gamers or just experiences, um, but also too people really seeing like what's sort of a second like career that I can have or, you know, an online based uh, lifestyle that I can create from my bedroom with just like streaming or entertaining themselves or just being a personality. So I think you see a lot more people, especially, especially now, just really kind of looking at like, well, what's going to be the future of multiple industries and how can we sort of keep this online offline experience, but really I think it's more of the community and the connection that we're building. We're really starting to see how technology can assist to collaboration, community and education. And I think that, you know, I hope that that's here to stay once, you know, we all can go back out. Um, I think that it is super important to share that knowledge across multiple countries or communities just from using the technology that we do have and more people will start to come up with more ingenious ways of how to either game or host tournaments online. I think that's something that is going to be pretty exciting to see what the future of it is going to look like. So, you know, I, I, I do think that with um, the pandemic and the fact that traditional sports have been pretty much shut down that uh, esports has gained so much uh, attention. And so I feel that a lot of um, brands and uh, you know entities and and actually uh, traditional sports people like David Beckham have jumped in to um, uh, invest in esports and you know it seems to me that um, branding you know kind of goes with with all of that um, um, that there there is an increase in interest. Uh, in branding, I mean, in, in advertising and in marketing with esports that goes along with the general interest. Um, is that is that so? Yeah, I think that you have a lot more traditional sports players being on esports because uh, it's fun to game. It also increases like, you know, their brand awareness. So people now know like, you know, football players, soccer players, uh, just sports players in general that Maybe they may not watch them play in during the season, but they may have watched them game on opportunity for a player to really show like, you know, more of their personality. Like 
other sports players too, which is pretty exciting to like, you know, see sports players like just being themselves off the field. Um, I think that the branding of it all and also just uh, people seeing the opportunity of having a, a another source of entertainment, which is like one of America's biggest exports as, you know, being entertaining. Um, I think it's going to be very exciting to see um, who else gets into the space and from what backgrounds of what traditional sports that they have. And I think that that's going to be, um, especially for soccer, I know that that's uh, like FIFA is played much uh, much more outside of the United States. So it's really exciting to see um, David Beckham like really like help brand it here in America. And it's gonna be exciting to see uh, just more games emerge and more traditional sports players potentially back a lot of these uh, games that are coming up for esports. And you know, one thing that we have seen is that um, because traditional sports isn't um, playing or hasn't played at certain times during the pandemic, um, that esports have actually been shown on uh, TV um, <laughs> on various channels. So that gives advertisers the opportunity to, um, you know, advertise in those um, arenas. But you know, I'm going to ask you one more question to wrap this up. And what do you see the future of marketing and esports to be? I see that there will be a lot more brand placement, um, especially as physical spaces are being built out for players and for organizations. Um, I think that also it would be great to see more um, education just around the esports industry as far as like, you know, if you, if you may not be athletically inclined to be a pro gamer, um, I, still, I still think that, you know, marketing is a great path for anyone to pursue that mm -hmm. wants to be creative, wants to work with influencers, also can be analytical and just really work from their experiences. So I really feel like the future of esports is definitely going to be people that really understand more about the gaming culture themselves and then can also tie in the traditional marketing channels such as um, TV, um, online based, and then also to like text communication, Discord servers. I think having a broad stroke of understanding how people are communicating is definitely going to be more of the focus on esports and marketing in the future. So that's that's kind of like my opinion on it. I think that there's going to be a lot of more exciting ways that um, professional like programmers and uh, brands are going to collaborate. I love the apparel collaborations that are existing. I think that that's going to be more to come with that as far as like marketing to players and even showing um, esports uh, apparel as more like a streetwear kind of feel. So I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, well, just the cross, the cross of different, um, different markets come into esports. Yeah, and you're in the right field. Uh, marketing and esports is quite exciting. Alex, thank you so much for being on uh, uh, the wide world of esports today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, thank you for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be esports PhD candidate Sky Kauveloa, and we'll see you then. Aloha. <laughs>